Hi there, Dr. Julian Bolliter here from the Australian Urban Design Research Centre presenting a project we conducted in 2018 called Missing in Action, Strategies for Delivering the Missing Middle in Perth. Um, the missing middle essentially refers to medium density uh, infill development, uh, which is sort of stranded in the gulf between suburbia or compact suburbia uh, in, on the fringe and middle ring suburbs and high rise development like we might get in central cities. So it's this middle, um, the missing middle really refers to this kind of low, low to mid rise walk up sort of apartments, classic European urbanism, I guess, which has been so elusive in the Australian, but particularly Perth context. Uh, we conducted this research project in 2018 for um, Audric's funding partners, the West Australian Planning Commission, uh, De Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage, Department of Communities and Development WA. So how did we go about it? So really to try and assess what the barriers were to, to this famed and elusive missing middle, we conducted a literature review um, to find out you know, what, what the academic literature says about the barriers to medium density infill. Um, we reviewed what we're currently delivering in Perth in terms of medium density infill. Uh, we conducted interviews with stakeholders. Um, we had um, private builders and developers, development institutes, parliamentarians, architects, state government planners, local government planners, councillors, community reps, planners in the private sector, real estate experts, civil engineers and urban designers. Um, we surveyed them to find out what they considered to be the main barriers um, to medium density infill and the missing middle in, in Perth. We then developed urban design strategies for delivering medium density development in Perth and applied them in a typical uh, activity centre site and concluded on some findings. So I'll walk you through that process uh, today. Okay, so from the literature review, we can see here some of the predominant community barriers that the literature regards um, should be affecting the, de the uh, delivery of medium density development. Community resistance to infill was regarded to be a main thing. And that's for a, for a couple of different reasons. Um, just general resistance. Um, resistance due to built heritage and neighbourhood character concerns. Um, concerns around increasing in a, de a decrease in open space amenity. Uh, poor quality medium density development, increases in traffic and parking nuisances, and social concerns about the kind of people who live in higher or let's say medium density infill set settings. So there were some of the kind of community barriers the literature revealed should be predominant. Uh, economic barriers. We know it's difficulties of obtaining finance, particularly for apartment developments, um, the cost and uncertainties of service infrastructure provision, a lot amalgamation challenges, a lack of economic incentive for developers who might otherwise be doing uh, greenfield development to consider complex medium density infill, construction and labour costs for mid-tier developers, excessive car parking requirements and problematic and sometimes unattractive sites. These are all economic barriers to delivering the elusive medium density missing middle we can see here in the diagram in orange. Regulatory barriers. There was, you know, the literature indicated often you have state government leadership or a lack of state government leadership and communication around medium density infill, a lack of state government containment policies on the fringe, i.e. we're not holding the line, therefore it's very difficult to do density. Sometimes local government opposition to infill, not always, but sometimes. Uh, ineffective local government community consultation frameworks, onerous local government garbage truck requirements, uh, main roads regulations regarding access and onto arterial roads where you might be trying to do density. Um, dealing with local governments who are not funded or trained to deal with medium density development in some cases. And planning approval delays and uncertainties were all regarded as being major impediments, regulatory impediments to the delivery of the missing middle to medium density. Um, and we can see this here in WA approve, uh, housing building approvals between 2012 and 17. And we find that we can see that in the four plus story range, which I think is picking up a lot of your more high rise apartment developments, we're certainly getting a, a high amount of dwellings being yielded there. But typically in your three story and that kind of range, low rise apartment, really there's a, there is you know, evidence there of, of the missing middle indeed in terms of that particular density of development. And we can see that over time too on the right hand graph here, 
just showing uh, between 2016 and 17, um, you know, while your apartment four plus stories kind of developments are, are going ahead, we're finding that the one to three story kind of apartment developments is really trailing off there. Um, you know, and this is this is what we're good at. It's a typical example of background infill. It's low risk. Survey strata take a suburban lot and subdivide it. Um, it's low risk in the sense it can be sold um, lot by lot. Um, it's not really complex in terms of the construction, uh, in terms of fire regulations, for instance, and lifts, uh, unionised labour and all the things which go with high rise development. Uh, it's low risk and it's easy to develop and evidently popular, despite some of the issues it has, which is that it's predominantly driveway now to our calculations sometimes in this form of background infill it can be 30 38% uh, driveway area which is a, you know really inefficient form and obviously often it doesn't have mature trees here we see there is some opportunity for that but that is not always the case you know so we're getting development in uh, in suburban areas which is very much around um, this survey strata low density infill Occasionally on corridors, we're getting infill development examples more like you see like this. But typically, again, um, you know, really not delivering much in terms of ur urban canopy cover often. Uh, and in, in many cases, is really dominated by vehicle crossovers and garage entrances. So there's kind of questions around the quality, uh, the spatial quality and experience, lived you know, experience of infill as we're delivering it at that more detailed scale. But when we zoom out, it looks something like this. So this is the central subregion of Perth, and we can see here the activity centre network of its primary city centre, secondary town centres, and major growth areas. But generally, these are Todd's. So this is the idea of density around transit. What we end up seeing, though, in the black here, which is this confetti, is where we're having the subdivision of suburban backyards. And often it's occurring not really near mass transit hubs where we have heavy rail lines, for instance. So there's a kind of dissonance there between our plans for density and where it's actually occurring. And uh, we can see here Perth's existing rail network, uh, pre-Metronet here. And again, much of that densification of backyards not occurring near mass transit hubs. And, you know, this is partly expressed in the percentage of people who drove to work. We can see here in some suburbs in the inner northern corridor here, you know, getting up around 70% of people are still driving to work. Um, despite the fact there's been a lot of density. So the idea that that would be density would, would be the crude lever to get us out of cars is, is not necessarily come to fruition in that, in that case. We also find that a lot of it is not near, you know, the natural amenity that people really seek out according to the compensation hypothesis when they move to a higher density. Natural amenity is most clearly expressed in regional open space, which we're seeing here. And many of the areas where we are doing a lot of density are not well served for regional open space. Now, not everyone would expect to be able to walk to regional open space, but there are a general mismatch, I think, here in some of those areas. And what we find is that the presence of background infill is definitely uh, registers on urban forests. Areas which have been really where residences are wealthy and well-connected and resourced and have vociferously often denied infill, um, we find that canopy cover can be 40% or getting up around that. Where suburbs where we don't have that, um, perhaps uh, Belmont, for instance, or Bayswater, uh, we're finding urban canopy cover can be as low as 5%. Um, so, you know, uh, sorry, 5% being an extreme, but there's definitely a correlation here between where background infill has really run right, I guess, and, and urban forests have been degraded. There's very much a correlation there. And that's not really surprising. It, it looks like something this on the ground. This is the kind of happy, unsubdivided suburbia that I grew up in. Um, and then we can see with background infill, I think, and, and those who know this urbanism well, and I live in it, would, would argue this is not an unflattering depiction of it. We see a real loss of urban canopy cover, which is a big issue from the perspective of urban livability. I mean, it's good for physical and mental health benefits. We know that. It regulates a local climate. It sequesters carbon, purifies water, uh, provides habitats to plants and animals and clean air, which is, if you like breathing, is good. Um, so, you know, there's some issues there. But, of course, it delivers a lot of housing in a fairly low-risk kind of model. So there's always trade-offs. Part of the reason you lose so much of the urban forest is because some 60% of trees are on private land. Um, 
and that's why you, you lose so much. But of course, this is triggering resistance to in, you know, infill. Not in my backyard has become bananaism, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything in some cases. So what did our, you know, we have the literature and that tells us certain things, but that's kind of more generic. But what did our respondents, all of these, you know, private builders and developers, counsellors and planners, what did they think were the biggest barriers to medium density infill in transit precincts? First and foremost, they did think it was community resistance. Um, that was a significant community barrier. We'll talk about these in a bit more detail. A lack of local government expertise, rightly or wrongly, was you know, it was regarded that local governments are not trained or necessarily resourced to deal with the complexities of medium density development, inadequacies of the R codes, which are not well calibrated to delivering your low rise, you know, medium density apartment dwellings and buildings. A lack of local government design guides. It was regarded that some local governments really just resist it but don't tell you what you should do. Uh, the ongoing problems of land assembly challenges. How do we get a decent slice of earth together? Um, which is feasible for development and where we can do something more serious. Um, and then also just development uncertainty, which would go with delayed and rejected local government development planning applications. And then the next order down was high construction costs, difficulty of securing pre-sales and finance. We know with apartment developments that often you need to sell 95% of the apartments before you can borrow the money to do the development. A lot of, lot of risk and low land values and service infrastructure uncertainties following closely behind. So look, you know, a formidable array of, um, of barriers there which you can see. Um, but then looking to the strategies that they felt could help achieve medium density. What they regarded as being really important were pilot medium density projects to educate communities and test assumptions. They felt like cor correlating upgraded public open domain with medium density development could be a way of incentivizing it. Uh, they felt it was really important to mandate minimum lot sizes for infill and incentivize land amalgamation, mandate minimum densities and protect and densify urban forest in medium density infill sites. Okay, so look, we'll talk through all of those in more detail. I won't focus on the barriers too much because I think, um, you know, that doesn't help necessarily. You need to know what to do. Okay, so they really felt that de deploying pilot projects to educate communities and test assumptions could be really important. Um, and as part of that, I think it was this idea that people don't trust renders really anymore. They don't trust the marketing spiel. They want to be able to see and feel, you know, really high quality, medium density building types to know it can be delivered and to know it won't be an assault on suburban livability and it can be done sensitively. Um, there, there was a kind of a perception that in many local government areas, there was really nothing you could point to. If you had a resistant community group, you couldn't point them to any particular development within their local area and lived experience to say, well, it could be this. And, it, you know, the world may not turn, stop turning if we deliver, you know, density in accordance with this model. But it was also felt that we don't really do long, long term longitudinal research around you know, the lived experience and the sustainability outcomes of these medium density uh, types. As one explained, one interviewee explained, I think one of the failings is we don't tend to do a review post-development so we can go back and say, okay, what was the community concerned about? Did those fears eventuate or not? Or what mitigation strategies were adopted in the design? Did they work or not? And so without having that long tune, longitudinal data, it was kind of perceived that every time you came up against a resistant community, you had it was like Groundhog Day and you had to win the argument all over again. Okay, a correlating medium density development with public domain upgrades. Um, so th there was a sense that um, it wasn't good enough just for to expect people to accept density because it would stop sprawl and sprawl is a bad thing. Um, so, as, as one interviewee elucidated, I think it has a lot to do with evolving community attitudes and demonstrating the benefits of media density housing. So, not just going beyond, we're trying to stop sprawl, but actually going, what can it deliver? I think much of that will come simply through the consistent de delivery of that and understanding that it delivers better streets where people are able to commune with one another. It delivers better levels of service in terms of more shops within walking distance, cafes, bars, those kind of things. 
So the idea here is that there can be a trade-off between density and improved public domain upgrades and urban diversity and, and, and buzz and vibrancy and public transport frequency. Um, so selling the benefits better is regarded as being an important strategy. The next one was really about setting limits and setting, um, in particular, minimum lots, mandating minimum lot sizes and incentivizing land lot amalgamation. As, as one developer said, developers just can't get big enough slabs of dirt. So rezoning it all, R60, R80, R100, is meaningless unless you have the framework that puts these lots together to give developers a decent piece of Perth to work with. Okay, so the idea here is that by mandating a minimum lot size, which might be 1,200 metres, it means you just can't do infill on any old um, unsubdivided suburban lot. You actually have to amalgamate it with the neighbours to be able to do something. And they felt that there needs to be much better education provided so that landowners do see the benefits of amalgamating, uh, density bonuses for when you do amalgamate and, and other incentives to, to, to not only curtail and, and hold the line with minimum lot sizes, but actually incentivising a uh, lot amalgamation was regarded as being important. Along a similar line, it was also about mandating minimum densities for infill. And as, as, as one of the interviewees expounded, the most important thing is that planners need to have courage and hold steady with their plans. And every time a plan doesn't seem to be rolling out the way they want, to avoid going, let's start again and reshape it. If we, if we look back and sit back and look at the property cycle, what doesn't work today will work in a few years. We live in a world of economic and market cycles. If Perth grows to a metropolitan population of 3 million by 2031, it will come back. It's just at the bottom of the market now. So here it is, they were saying it's about being patient and creating the appropriate frameworks and that over time medium density and the missing middle will happen. So there's an idea here that we have to be patient and we have to hold our nerve and that by squandering opportunities, by doing this kind of low density background infill, by the time market conditions improve to the point where we really can to deliver medium density, um, we will have squandered all the great opportunities in terms of sites. And that was a real issue, you know. So this idea, we just need to hold our nerve. And, and when market conditions come back, uh, that we will be able to, you know, that they'll, the land values will start to force the medium density outcomes that we're seeking. Um, okay, so there was, as we know from the perceived barriers, it was regarded that communities are very hostile to... Um, to infill generally, but also particularly medium density infill. Uh, and it was regarded that we really need to do better in terms of um, giving um, and protecting urban tree, urban significant urban trees, uh, which maintain the urban forest, uh, and that we need to be more flexible in the way we design medium density infill to try and work our way around uh, urban forests. The idea being here that, you know, um, as you increase the density of urban form, you should also increase the density of, of the urban canopy cover. So the Victoria Park town team had an, ev had an interesting proposal here to set a minimum target for 49 metres squared of tree canopy cover per resident. So as you get more people, you need to densify the urban forest uh, cover. A lot of the resistance to density is because it's seen to be an assault on suburban livability and its leafy greenness. So this way you're densifying greenery and you're densifying urbanity and you get the best of both you know and there's different ways we could look at doing that um, is it about you know um, courtyard dwellings where you live on the roof and can keep lots of ground space for mature trees and we can see that here you know the idea of a modular courtyard kind of dwelling which can be orientated around trees in a quite flexible sort of way which could deliver a very livable medium density um, it was also felt that we really need to educate local government about medium density. Uh, so when they confront uh, resistance to density from community groups or members, they're able to kind of um, speak to the benefits of medium density in an informed way. Now, obviously, um, local government uh, and levels of expertise in local government about medium density is very different across the board. Um, so this is not a, a general characterisation, but it was a general perception that further education wouldn't hurt. As one respondent said, there is a lack of education on both the planning and consumer side. So people ring up the council and ask, hey, what's going on with this development? And the planner being like, meh, 
I don't know. It's either compliant or it's not compliant. I don't know whether it's good or bad. It's just compliant or not compliant. Um, it was also felt that we need to provide a medium density, consistent medium density policy across, um, you know, the central sub-region in particular. So, so developers are not um, having to navigate the intricacies of separate policies for different local government areas. Um, as, as one interviewee explained, you know, developers in the property council aren't going to sign up for medium density unless there's some more consistency across the board. So, you know, apples for apples. I was also felt that we need to find better ways of engaging communities around medium density. Uh, often, you know, the, the first experience land, suburban landholders um, or residents, the first experience they get of medium density, uh, you know, in their local environment is when they get a um, notification that there's going to be a development next door and they react accordingly. But we need to be more preemptive. And there was a perception that there's a failure of state government to really talk to most members of the community, particularly older generations, because they're not getting the benefits of density. So what our proponents, sorry, what our interviewees were saying is we need to sell it much better through really aggressive marketing, TV and newspaper, and find different ways of engaging communities around it. And um, an image here of uh, co-design models built by um, Audrey colleague Anthony Duckworth, which really allow people to get hands on um, with experiences of medium, with ideas of medium and strategies for pro and proposals for medium density, which are not about renders, which I think are, people are a bit suspicious of, but actually allow them to really engage with uh, suburban change in a way that is very tactile. It was felt that we could do much better to develop medium density timber and lightweight construction, that this would improve the feasibility of medium density. Um, Perth has always been a bricks and mortar city. Um, you know, but we've seen in projects like Lights View in South Australia, quite wonderful um, three-storey um, terrace and townhouse construction being done entirely in timber, even with lift cores being doing, done in timber, which could certainly, uh, if we were able to build uh, the industry around timber more, uh, it would give us a, a greater diversity of, of um, material, which would help in material shortages. But I think it also could reduce the costs associated with uh, medium density development, such as we're seeing in projects like Lights View. And might actually, you know, our suburbs are generally fairly lightweight accretions. You know, the, the incorporation of timber in construction of medium density also could seek, perhaps could soften um, community resistance to some degree. It was felt that we need to improve the adaptability of medium density building types. And this would be helped with lightweight um, modular construction, perhaps using timber, um, you know, where we're able to be more flexible in terms of the medium density that we're building. You know, and, and flexibility is such a great characteristic of the suburbs as we've traditionally built them. You had a third child, you put another bedroom on. So trying to do medium density in a way which is more flexible uh, and adaptable over time could also help to reduce barriers. Uh, parking uh, requirements were regarded as often being too onerous and we saw that with the medium density sort of or low to medium density background infill where some 38 percent of the lot and you can just see it there in a small image is is car park you know is essentially driveway and then you know carports are more on top of that um, but you know the idea that you know street reserves could be a much better way of delivering uh, and, and uh, allowing for parking in an efficient way where we look at our streets as both areas for parking and for play and they become much more uh, shared zones as in this diagram but that by getting cars off the um, suburban lots as we develop them we can actually ha it gives us a lot more flexibility for maintaining those big trees which are so crucial to community support for density. Uh, getting close to the end here, number 12, I think it is, which is limiting infill and greenfill development sites. So there's a feeling that we really need to hold the line on the fringe um, and that without doing that, we won't be able to build up um, the impetus we need to really get medium density uh, sites happening. So this wasn't just about not doing greenfield or doing less greenfield. It was also about limiting the number of sites you're trying to do infill in so you can really get in there and provide the you know, provide the, the funding for infrastructure upgrades that you need or the, the money for, for running high frequency, you know, rapid bus or train transit 
Um, you know, if you do less sites, you can do more of those things. So it was about sort of limiting where you're trying to do medium density and then going harder where you are. You know, Perth has something like 93 activity centres. It's not to say that's too much, but, you know, we might just need a clear hierarchy in the order of where do we really focus and where do we, you know, really go for it in that sense. Okay, so we now tested these kind of generic principles in a typical site. Uh, we picked a Todd that's been very slow to get off the mark, which is the Morley Activity Centre. It uh, has a fairly high frequency bus transit now, courtesy of the 950 uh, bus from Morley to the city and through to UWA. Thank you very much. But there hasn't been much land, you know, like density response other than we've been getting a lot of background infill in the areas around the Morley Galleria Shopping Centre and the bus station. Um, you know, another typical study area here we can see... Um, on the left, which is Whitford Centre, you know, not an easy suburban fabric to try and densify in. And then again in the Maylands Activity Centre, which, you know, we have had some coordinated medium density development there. So we, we developed an indicative series of building types which were based on the interviews we conducted and this idea of modularity, lightweight construction, um, you know, adaptability, uh, ability to, you know, this kind of courtyard dwellings where you can wrap them around trees. And we considered how they could be deployed, um, you know, in a typical suburban site such as um, the ones I've just indicated. I, I should note this is not a medium density guide um, and we're kind of, <laughs> things kind of got a little bit loose here. But I guess after all this systematic accounting of barriers and strategies, um, we, we just tried to, you know, creatively engage with them and, and deploy them. So here's a, you know, a typical site, might, much like you might find... Um, on the edge of you know the activity the the Morley activity centre, so it's you know R12, R15, um, and you know till fairly recently it was typically unsubdivided. So what our respondents were saying to us was hold the hold the ground, don't don't just do background and fill in these important sites such as right next to an activity centre. So planning restrictions, minimum densities and minimum lot sizes actually just prevent development for a while, until you build up the impetus around it. And this is where infill really starts to happen. So we're holding the line here, holding the line on the fringe more. We're trying to do density in less places. And that means we can afford to upgrade service infrastructure, um, you know, which is, which is systematically upgraded. So the, the development uncertainty which goes with uh, uncertainties around uh, infrastructure are obviated. Um, you know, that we develop pre-approved modular housing types to ease approval processes, you know, uh, we upgrade streetscapes uh, in the adjacent streetscapes so that, you know, existing residents feel um, some reason to be sort of supporting density, you know. Uh, and that can be in parks and it can be in streetscapes. Um, and again, we're trying to get contiguous lots because we know that's where we can get these sort of, you know, ideas, connectivity between streets or where we can really do more significant medium density without really annoying the neighbours. We need a big slicer first to do, to do that. So that'll come through mandating minimum lot sizes, but also incentivising lot amalgamation and running education commands com, uh, campaigns on how you do that, likely through local government. Uh, and we're maintaining the mature, you know, the mature trees, which helps to then again soften that resistance. And we can see, you know, what that starts to look like there. Uh, you know, and phase two infill continues. So, you know, it's like a reef that slowly accretes over time. You know, the idea that you would then, you know, densification is kind of accreting around these upgraded streets and upgraded parks. Again, service infrastructure is easily upgraded. Communities are seeing that you're getting density without losing urban canopy cover. So they're seeing it can be done. There's pilot projects that they can visit and they can feel hopefully good about and reassured by. You know, and in the fullness of time, it starts to look something like this. Um, so, the, you know, this is medium density development, but delivered in a way which resonates with the leafy greenness of our suburbs. Let's dive into that in a little more detail, zooming in the same stages again, holding the line, minimum densities, minimum lot sizes, development starting to occur, a parking in, in many cases, as much as possible, being delivered in streetscapes, with permeable turf paving, getting the cars a little bit off those private lots, trying to maintain those mature trees, lightweight timber, modular construction. OK. 
Okay. You know, I know it makes it seem easy. And I'm sure, you know, there are other barriers that these would confront. But these are based on what our interviewees told us would be the most effective ways of softening the resistance and the barriers to medium density development. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a model here that could be deployed in select sites across the city and would be really effective in, in reconciling the way we're currently doing medium density with the suburban milieu, which is going to be the dominant experience of Perth from here on. We need to work with that sensibility. We're not going to become a Paris anytime soon. We need to be able to work with the suburbs with their leafy green amenity and the aspirations of people who live in them to effectively deliver medium density. And I think this is what this site testing is trying to show. So just to zoom out, according to the UN, from 2000 to 2015 in all regions of the world, the expansion of urbanised land outpaced the growth of urban populations, resulting in urban sprawl. So what's happening here is cities are spreading much faster than their populations are increasing. Okay. So we know the problems of sprawl and we know that the only way to work with it or to, to really deal with those problems, I think, is going to be to go with it. There's a kind of Zen thing here where we need to, I think, work with the sensibility of our suburbs, you know, which are the dominant experience of Australian cities and continue to be. And I think um, so this report, this research has really tried to, you know, one, forensically under understand what are the major barriers to density. We know that's around community resistance and development feasibility. What strategies can we deploy? You know, is it is it things like holding the line a bit more, mandating minimum densities, mandating minimum lot sizes, producing um, pilot projects which people can feel and experience and be convinced by? These are the things which should mean that we'll be able to densify you know, this beautiful suburban city of Perth in a way which resonates with its aspirations. I uh, just wanted to recognise the contributors to the report. Uh, Chris Melsom, who was uh, co-director of the research, uh, Dr Zoe Myers, who was involved in the interviews, and Grace Oliver for the graphic and, and helping with design production. Uh, thank you very much. hope it's of some use. The paper uh, for this project has been uploaded to the Audric website and uh, can be downloaded and uh, reviewed by anyone. Thank you.